Thank you. I would like to thank the Metal Guild of Seattle for inviting me. It was a surprise to receive a, an invitation in May, and uh, it's a good opportunity for me to, to come in this side of the world. Um, I was born in, uh, in a city in North Italy, and um, I lived, uh, I've always lived uh, in a historical center of some places. And when I was 11, I still believed uh, in Santa Claus. And uh, I asked uh, to Santa Claus if I could have for Christmas an oxyacetylene kit. <laughs> In our part of the world, obviously, Santa Claus is a bit uh, irresponsible because by the time he gets to Italy, he's totally drunk. So he, he actually brought it to me. And I've been fascinated and playing with metal since I was a child. I didn't know at that time that I would be uh, a goldsmith. I knew I wanted to uh, melt different metals than uh, uh, and lead, which I was melting on the stove of, uh, of the kitchen. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what it started, uh, how it started. Um, if you give uh, an oxyacetylene kit to a child, it either goes well or goes badly. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, when I was uh, 13, I, had, I could choose uh, uh, what type of school I would uh, do for the next eight years. That's the high school. And uh, in Padua, I was lucky that there was an art school uh, with a very uh, good metalwork, and, uh, metalwork, silversmithing, and uh, jewelry course. Uh, it was a good course because uh, of the type, of the structure of the course and uh, of uh, the quality of the teachers. This is the building where uh, the school was. This is the school uh, I went to. And it was originally built into, in the, I think, 19th century as uh, an abattoir. And, uh, and this was our class of, um, of uh, life drawings with all the cast plaster of uh, the classical uh, sculptures. Um, I realized only much later how lucky I was to, to grow up in an environment that was full of art. I, I was not aware um, that that was not normal, that you, know, you could walk on Sunday and see paintings, uh, a complete chapel, uh, a fresco by Giotto, and uh, without queuing, it was just going there and playing football outside. Um, I was also, I consider myself very lucky that I met a few people that uh, taught me how to uh, work, but uh, especially how to learn. And um, so, uh, as you uh, can imagine, my parents uh, uh, never kept me away from danger. They always explained what, uh, uh, how danger worked. So uh, they encouraged, well, they didn't really encourage it. They didn't uh, uh, block me. And uh, they allowed me to, uh, to play with metal. I, my, I, after school, I worked with uh, my master. And uh, when, uh, after a few years, uh, he, um, he sent me to a friend of his, uh, uh, which is this man, uh, Paolo Maurizio, who gave me really a lot. He taught me how to, how to learn and how to resolve problems. So going quite quickly uh, through some, uh, some of my earlier work, uh, I would like to illustrate three projects uh, of, that I did. So um, this is work that done in Padua. It's a necklace uh, of typically uh, Paduan style of the mid 80s. And, uh, and then I, I started, uh, I wanted to make uh, uh, work with, uh, that would be transparent 
and light, but at the same time quite large. And uh, I started uh, thinking about uh, working with wire. Um, wire allowed me to uh, create forms that would be transparent and uh, at the same time having a structure that uh, would be resistant. So I, I started thinking and I developed uh, a three-dimensional knitting technique, uh, which is basically based on, uh, on the conventional uh, textile knitting, except that instead of working with two needles, I worked with a series of needles in one surface, uh, building up like a, a tower. And in this way, I built uh, some brooches. This is work and uh, a bracelet. Um, the work I'm showing is not in chronological order. There is a kind of a sense in what I'm showing, uh, uh, grouping things uh, by maybe by mainly by technique. Um, so. After five years uh, of school in Padua, um, my master <coughs> told me I, I should go abroad. At that time it was not so common to go to study abroad for a European going from a, to another country. And I applied uh, to go to the Royal College of Art to, in London to do uh, my master. And I got, uh, I passed the entrance examination and I got into the master program. And while I was uh, um, studying in London, I started uh, thinking, yes, I will still want to work with thin wire and make transparent things, but let's try another way to put them together. So I, um, I made uh, the, the first piece, which is this brooch, by soldering lots of little wires together. With the same techniques, uh, technique later uh, in the years I made uh, more pieces. Basically all these pieces are made uh, by uh, soldering one element on top of the other. And the process, I, I find it very similar to make a sketch or make a drawing. So you add an element uh, at the time where you think it, it, um, it requires. And all these elements are soldered um, first um, yeah, they are uh, soldered together with a micro torch. This is um, uh, a water torch, a very fine water torch, and um, and then forged and then uh, uh, assembled. And here, this is the last piece I made with uh, with this technique. It's not. I will make some more, obviously, but. Uh, uh, this was made in 2018, and it's like every time I make a, a piece, I try to um, to improve uh, details uh, where there can be some improvements, and um, and look after every detail of, of the object. Uh, it's not something. Uh, my way of working is. Uh, um, it's economically not very uh, <laughs> sustainable, <laughs> but uh, never mind. I enjoy it. <laughs> there is something else in life. And um, another, um, this is really putting pressure. <laughs> another uh, way of working something that my work is known for is uh, the granulation, which I don't do. Um, <laughs> I have uh, uh, been asked to, uh, for a competition to reinterpret uh, uh, granulation, and so I, I came up with uh, something that looks like granulation, but is much cleaner and nicer in the, pro the process, I think. And, um, so this is the detail, as you can see, probably, yeah, uh, there are little uh, tiny bunches of wires uh, melted at the end. They are all melted each individually uh, with a microflame. And here, I just, you know, I connect to Julia's um, talk. You know, there are about 10,000 little bowls, uh, and having uh, perfected and found actually a good tool, a good microflame. Uh, if you speed up of a fraction of a second each ball, 
It's uh, a few weeks of uh, time I've saved. Uh, the end. <laughs> and with this technique, I, I made uh, several pieces uh, over the year. I tend to uh, go back. I don't uh, work. I don't limit myself to what I have to do, or things don't necessarily have to be always new. Sometimes uh, I I just do what uh, comes in my mind uh, and what uh, because. When I design a piece, uh, I don't draw it. I just think about it. And, uh, and I don't have uh, the possibility of making it because I'm always working on something else. So uh, I might uh, uh, make a few pieces with a technique like this one and, uh, and then uh, work on something else and then go back to, to that technique. So I jump from one way of working to another. Also because I get bored or uh, I don't want to stay for years in the same posture, and it's not healthy. <laughs> um, one big change in, uh, in my life uh, uh, happened uh, about 20 years ago, when I decided to move away from the town where I was born, from Padua, and move to central Italy. Um, it's not really the, um, the environment that changed, it's the fact that I was in a place where um, nobody knew me, and uh, I felt uh, very free. Also, in my personal life, there were some changes, and uh, and I began really to be uh, to feel free. I've always been free, but uh, I never really felt it uh, as much as when I moved uh, uh, to Todi. Uh, so this is the the square in Todi, which is the center of a, of a town. Um, I'll show you the sorry. Okay. Okay, this is the interior of um, my workshop. Um I don't know if you saw because I'm a bit confused here. Um well, the town is really tiny. There is uh, there are about uh, three thousand people living in uh, in the center, and there is nothing else outside the center. The the center is a historical center uh, built uh, in the Middle Age, and uh, as it was built, uh, it stayed. Um, it's it's very um, uh, picturesque, and it's very nice to to live in a place that has history. It's not very comfortable. Um, you can't touch a single stone without asking the permission, and uh, things are difficult to bring in. On the other hand, they are very, there is some safety in that, because the houses are very close together, and there is some energy about the places, and you see the, the energy and the thought of uh, the people that built uh, the places. I, I bought, uh, um, initially I just bought a, a workshop, uh, which was the ground floor in an in a old building from the 15th century, and I renovated it. And, uh, and then I had uh, the opportunity of uh, buying an apartment uh, upstairs, and so I, have, uh, I live uh, above uh, my workshop. And, um, and there, in, in Todi, this freedom and this being uh, in a different place uh, uh, made me feel more free too. Here are the, some pieces made uh, in between Padua and Todi. That's some details. Uh, a lot of my work uh, has to be looked uh, under the, a loop or a microscope. It's made under a microscope and I don't really want uh, it to be uh, necessarily seen, but uh, I like that uh, that there are a lot of there is a, a wealth of details uh, that I'm hiding uh, on, in front. It's not behind something you don't have to uh, to to solve a riddle to to find it. You only have to look very close. So in this way, I, I like to select the people that uh, um, 
that receives all this energy and work that uh, that I put on in my work uh, by uh, basically the, the people that are more attracted to the work and they get closer and they they see more in this in this way I feel like to protect my own uh, work and to keep it uh, to give it uh, to the people that I like that we have something in common with. Okay. Um, I did actually do some uh, some real granulation at a certain point because I was asked to teach it, and uh, and so I had to learn it first. <laughs> and, uh, and here are some details of some some work which uh, it's the closest thing that there is to uh, the Etruscan granulation that I made, and this is a detail of a brooch that was particularly successful. And um, also, uh, al always playing uh, with uh, this ethereal, ethereal um, quality and uh, drawing down the wire thinner and thinner to get uh, to make the, the object more and more transparent. Actually, I, I started playing with the transparency of the object, suspending uh, some elements uh, in uh, in this transparent medium which uh, was this wool or fluff of, uh, of gold and uh, sometime at the beginning it used to be uh, drops uh, either granulation granules of gold suspended on platinum and by the way platinum is my second best friend <laughs> and um, or uh, there would be these, these in particular are drops of niello which is uh, an alloy Silver, copper, lead, and sulfur, and uh, and then I I decided to do some experiment and go thinner uh, with my wire. So I had to clean up my workshop and work in a more clean, uh, more aseptic environment. So I eliminated the, the yellow from uh, from the whole workshop, and I started uh, uh, replacing it uh, with enamel, uh, for example. And, uh, and so this is a detail of a pendant uh, with uh, enamel and um, and pla on platinum. This is a bracelet uh, with uh, enamel on 22 karat gold. The frame of the bracelet is uh, 18 karat gold. And, uh, and this correspond. Uh, this work it was done in a period of uh, playfulness. Uh, <laughs> and not only uh, freedom, but there was even in a mood to joke. And uh, I also, yes, worked with uh, with white enamel. This was a, a piece that I thought uh, is so. This is gonna sell at Christmas for sure. <laughs> um, and this is a piece that I particularly like, uh, although it's never been photographed properly. And uh, here is a short, very, very short video of me uh, putting together these uh, frames. I, I like building my jigs to, to hold, uh, the, to help me. So that um, brass jig was done, cut on the, on the lathe and on the milling machine. And, um, and it helps me to hold together the, these geometric shapes, mainly because when um, um, when you solder, things start distorting, and there are so many soldering uh, joints, and that everything would start working. And uh, again, because of my, uh, I became a bit obsessed with uh, with uh, being clean. There is a reason why I'm obsessed because uh, if you want to draw down a very ex extremely fine wire, um, the main uh, enemy is dust. Uh, especially abrasive dust. So I have completely eliminated uh, any sort of uh, abrasive powder or paper from my the whole workshop. And when I like things to be polished, I I polish them uh, with uh, with an engraver, with a polished engraver, and I give a, a cut uh, to reflect the light. So th this is the, the polishing uh, method that I use. And also this, I, I feel, it gives more a crisp, uh, a crisp edge, uh, polishing 
unless he was really better than what I am at polishing, uh, tends to make everything a bit curved on the edges. And um, yeah, this is a detail of the brooch that, that I was finishing. And I like to, uh, I like my object, I would like my object, I mean, when they are, uh, yes, when, when somebody sees uh, the object like I want, um, I like the fact that they are shapes and that you can hold in your hand and that so you have a physical relationship. I wouldn't be able to make uh, sculptures. Uh, it's not my size. But I also like uh, when uh, you view on the microscope, or you have a view of this type, and this is what you see under a microscope, uh, to be immersed in a, in a cosmos. So, uh, so that I would like if the piece is inviting you, which it happens with a, a, some good art that I see uh, when it draws me in into the object, into the mind of the of the artist, and um, so here is the the piece that triggered uh, me to to get an idea. So drawing, making gold thread thinner and thinner and thinner. At a certain point, uh, I found myself that I was handling some material that was new to me. It was not, didn't have the quality of metal. It had more of the quality of a fiber. So I started uh, uh, having problems handling it uh, as metal, and I started thinking about it uh, as a, a fiber. You know, I'm able after 15, 20 years, 15 years of uh, practice uh, to. Um, to make a, a fiber in gold. So what, can, what, what does fiber mean? What, what, does it, what is it used for, for textile? To make cloth, or to make uh, uh, something that is in contact with the skin. And what is the quality of a fiber? The better, the, better, uh, the nicer, the more precious the fiber is, the, the thinner is the fiber. And the more it, it's pleasant uh, to touch. So this is one, something I wanted to add to my Jewelry. I'm just realizing that I'm speaking a very bad English. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not really my first language. Um, my grandma is very well. But anyway, uh, so um, the first idea I, I had was it would be fantastic uh, to, to make a cloth out of gold, something that covers uh, the. And then uh, thinking about uh, the tactile quality of the cloth, I thought, what is the nicest thing to touch? Fur. Fur is, uh, um, is something very pleasant to touch. Touching an animal is particularly relaxing and uh, pleasant. And, uh, and it's also, uh, fur has a, a symbology of something that protects, covers, but also shows uh, uh, maybe wealth or power. And um, so it has a symbology and a practical uh, quality. And uh, thinking about making fur of gold, I, I thought, I found it. Uh, it was uh, an idea that uh, it wasn't mine. It was something that existed in history for thousands of years in the Mediterranean mythology and not only in the Greek one, the, the uh, fur of gold uh, mm, was the golden fleece of the story of Jason, of the myth of Jason and the Argonaut. And, um, but there are also other examples on minor uh, tales uh, in the mythology, and not only in the Greek one, but uh, Mesopotamia. And, and, uh, and also I found uh, the, the same object uh, uh, represented in alchemy, which is a, a subject that I uh, like very much, fascinated me very much. Being the son of two chemists, the physical chemists, uh, I was uh, rebellious, rebellious enough to, not <laughs> to go and uh, look at the, the ancient uh, um, alchemy, which had uh, a lot of irrationality uh, compared to the modern chemistry, especially the one that my father was working on. 
So I had this idea of uh, making the golden fleece. This became a, a dream. It was a dream, and uh, and I think we we all, uh, especially when we are children, uh, we all have big dreams, and then we we get to we are always in contact with people that gives us wise suggestions, which is you know our dreams are here and. Uh, our uh, possibilities are down here, and uh, and we are always being told lower your dream, so lower your expectation and better yourself, and reach a compromise, which is wise. Uh, how much you do that? Uh, it depends a lot on your situation, where you are, who you are, what your character is, and uh, I was uh, in. The, I found myself that uh, studying and trying to solve all the technical problem of making fleece out of gold, um, I, I found a solution in a moment uh, in which I had the possibility to do it. Um, I had uh, um, divorced for, not just divorced, but for long enough uh, to, be, uh, to become serious again. So to go back to... Uh, uh, stable uh, situation. I I was free. I didn't have very many uh, responsibilities. I had my own workshop, my own house. Um, I had a collection of pieces uh, that were uh, occasionally selling, and um, and so I, I thought, yes, I can uh, I can afford uh, making something a big project. And um, what actually ha happened is that uh, I met uh, a young girl, a Russian girl, um, while I was teaching in, uh, in Estonia, and uh, we fell in love. And when we were together in a, during a conference in Manchester, um, I was thinking about this golden fleece. There was one particular detail, technical detail, that uh, would stop me and had stopped me for uh, a couple of years. And um, and she was talking about something completely different. Uh, I was in another in another room, and then I something clicked. I don't know why in that moment. Maybe because I was relaxed. And uh, I came back from the trip. I stopped what I was doing, which was a brooch which I never finished. It was half finished and then I melted it. And I started, I decided, okay, now I take two years of my time to, to make a collection of five pieces, all made out of gold fur. And uh, these five pieces uh, were, they are not in an order, but uh, first uh, there was uh, the brooch, and um, after the brooch, the ring that you just uh, sew. And uh, so, this is the back of the brooch. Um, all these pieces are composed of, uh, they are made like a carpet. So they are a structure that holds uh, bunches of very, very many thin wires. And to the touch they feel like, uh, yeah, like touching an animal, a soft animal. And uh, it was a big risk that I, I took. Uh, taking like two sabbatical years, uh, and uh, I made uh, some calculation. I set myself a deadline, which was an exhibition. Somebody gave me the um, the space uh, to exhibit uh, this collection, trusting me that I would be able to finish it, to make it. And um, so that gave me a bit of pressure and uh, kind of a, a com made a commitment. Um, to finish and to, to stay on time. I knew that uh, two years was the maximum of, uh, um, of time I could allow myself without freaking out. And, um, and so in these two years I worked very hard. Uh, I was working on a schedule of uh, about 14 hours per day and having three breaks. And so, a bit like the people who go on their own in the ocean, um, kind, of, kind of things you can do when you're alone. My girlfriend at that time, this Russian girl, uh, she was coming and visiting, visit me, she was still finishing her studies in, uh, in Tallinn, in Estonia. 
And, uh, and so I could do this. Sorry? Okay. And um, so this is the third piece of the uh, collection, a pendant. It's quite large, it's about 12 centimeters, I don't know how much is that in inches, but yeah, you see my hand there. And it's con so this shows you how it's constructed. It's a solid shape in gold where I put through all these bunches of wires and they are held together and, and glued together with an organic glue which then it gets burnt in the kiln and then the whole thing gets brushed. And, uh, and this was uh, the fourth piece, uh, the bracelet which, uh, when I was washing it, uh, I had this great idea to dry it with a comp like I made myself a jig for making it turn, like with a ball bearing, and, uh, and so I thought, if I dry it with compressed air, it starts spinning, and uh, it goes uh, fluffy, and it kind of it puffs up, which is what I did for the first ring I showed you, except that I didn't take into consideration the weight of, uh, uh, of the whole object and while it was spinning really fast it broke the solder and it flew across the road the, not the road, the, the whole workshop and that was after uh, 950 hours of work <laughs> so uh, I managed to shave a part of it um, <laughs> We, uh, we put the, the fur and it stays, uh, uh, but now it stays closed. I mean, it can be open, but if, you, if I open it, you would see the... Uh, so basically, it's, a, it's an exhibition piece. It's a, it cannot be worn. Um, here, this is a, a jig that I made uh, to, to, to draw down my wire. Um, I don't invent tools, uh, not very much. I borrow uh, ideas from, uh, from other people or from the industry and I make everything very simplified and very, uh, at a very low budget. And I think that keeping uh, things simple at the end uh, at a low budget is what uh, allowed me to, to survive through this quite ambitious project. So, this is a, a, a very simple jig that helps me to draw down wire without having it touch the floor and collecting or the table and collecting uh, dust. Obviously, it's speeded up. And, uh, when I, I made this um, this little movie, I didn't take into consideration that it's about three and a half hour in which I couldn't move because I was filming it. <laughs> it was quite, quite difficult. And because of my relationship with uh, uh, Maria, this uh, Russian uh, Estonian girl, we started talking about literature. I was listening at uh, the classical ra Russian literature, Tolstoy and uh, Dostoevsky, Turgenev. And, um, and I got much, very much into the uh, kind of what I could imagine uh, the, uh, the Russian society and uh, nobility was uh, in the 18th, 19th century, 19th century mainly. And I decided to make a, a headpiece, a, a Russian type of uh, fur hat. So um, the, the headpiece was meant to be, well, it is. Uh, woven one part and uh, uh, woven with the fur, the, the rest. So here it's, uh, I show you the, the process of weaving the, the head part. And uh, uh, the actual weaving is a mixture, a, a crossing between braiding and, uh, and weaving. Uh, so uh, the threads are held in, in tension by these steel weights. And, uh, and as I was going out of the center, uh, I had to add more threads huh? so that the cloth would stay dense. It's basically um, a spiral cloth uh, um, radiating from the center where the warp is radial and uh, the weft is a spiral. 
and uh, the, the other part of, uh, of this uh, was uh, a cylindrical cloth that then had a, a part in the middle that was uh, like a carpet, so with uh, lots of uh, wires knotted. And, uh, um, and this is the, the finished piece. <laughs> This is a detail from the back. This is the woven part. And this is Maria. <laughs> um, then uh, what happened is that when I finished uh, this um, collection, uh, Maria had finished uh, her studies. She came to live with me. And uh, she was pregnant with my first, uh, our first child, and um, and I thought uh, I couldn't really go back to work when uh, having an event in my life. Uh, so so I I thought okay, I extend my sabbatical uh, another eight months, nine months, and uh, and I thought I want to do something. Uh, I don't want to stay in the workshop uh, while uh, my son is. Uh, Home. So I thought of uh, I wanted to do something that I could work on at home. So the idea of making the cloth cloth of gold, which is the original <laughs> idea that came before um, before the golden fleece, uh, I thought yes, the, I, a cloth can be woven uh, in most of the part, and I don't need a goldsmithing workshop. I just need to prepare some material and then weave it, uh, braid it. But, thread and weave it uh, in, at home. And uh, I actually, sorry, I had, while I was making the golden fleece, I had developed uh, some new ways of annealing and drawing down the wire, uh, which allowed me to make uh, the, the gold wire very, very thin, much thinner than those of the golden fleece. So here you're looking at the microscope uh, um, picture of a bundle of about uh, 98, I think, they are, um, threads of gold. Uh, the gold is about 7 microns in diameter, and you can see that uh, the wool, which is a fine wool, uh, the blue one, it's, uh, it's much thicker than uh, the gold. It's just that the wool is a protein and it's slightly uh, transparent, and the gold is not transparent at that uh, uh, thickness. And uh, all those fibers, uh, they had to be held together for the weaving. And uh, usually uh, the, in textile industry, the material is spun to give it a twist uh, and, uh, and to hold together. So if a fiber breaks, uh, it doesn't jam the loom. So after making this, th this was uh, actually, the, apart from yeah, the head piece, uh, I don't know if it can be considered a piece of jewelry, but uh, mm, a cloth, uh, uh, which is actually a handkerchief in, in gold, uh, <laughs> is definitely an object, and, uh, and a very pointless uh, object. Uh, uh, there is so much work uh, in uh, something that... And um, I liked uh, the idea of making objects in, in gold, uh, because uh, in that way, the, I was I felt f free to, to make an object that, that doesn't necessarily have to be practical or has to be related to any part of the body or to the gender of the person that wears it. So I <coughs> I made a, a, a few boxes. So this it's not that I made one after the other, but uh, it, it happened that uh, I made a few boxes. Uh, this in particular is carved. It's all the from a thick sheet of metal, it's carved and pierced because I was really tired of drawing down wire and I wanted to do a completely different process. So, and uh, so then I made another box constructing, constructing it uh, with little elements like the brooches I showed before and one <coughs> With uh, um, constructed in gold uh, with uh, platinum granules, 
and uh, the inner shell is uh, pierced, so corresponding to the granule there are some, some holes uh, in the inside, and uh, the holes are beveled and diamond polished. And this is another box. Uh, they are all hand size. Uh, they are um, about nine, ten centimeters. Uh, what is that? Three and a half inches in diameter. And uh, this box in particular, they they all have. Uh, when when I need to arrange some uh, some dots of some elements into a circle, I am. <coughs> I look at how nature does, and uh, nature all very often uses uh, the, the famous Fibonacci uh, pattern, which is a crisscross of spirals uh, ordered in, uh, in number and uh, direction. So it's a growth uh, pattern. And, uh, and here I use the dynamo on top. Uh, so um, all these wires are melted at the end into a little bowl and then curled. That's uh, part of the construction of the box that shows uh, how I thread the wires through the, the sheet, uh, how I, when they are still standing, I enamel some of them and then I curl uh, with some fine tweezers <coughs> the, um, the end. Wow. And, uh, okay. This, uh, this is the last uh, chapter. It's the, this, uh, now I'm talking about the, the research I've been doing in the last four, four and a half years. Huh? Um, I always have been fascinated uh, about the uh, vacuum uh, in, a, in a physical and uh, also mental uh, sense. Um, one of uh, I, I remember always talking with uh, with my father, and uh, he used to say, "Yes, you would need uh, uh, to do this under vacuum to be to be working." Um, they, we don't uh, think about it, but we are immersed uh, in uh, in the broth, of, which is the atmosphere, which is uh, not just oxygen, but is full of vapors uh, and uh, dust and. If the, our experience, the experience of material, including gold, uh, and how they behave, they behave like that because we are immersed uh, and they are immersed in an atmosphere. Actually, one of the questions I've always asked myself is, why do we find metals or minerals in uh, um, concentrated uh, like gold with gold, uh, silver with silver, uh, quartz with quartz. Why does a, a molecule or an atom join another atom of its own kind? And how is, uh, how are the elements, uh, how are they created? Because the earth doesn't create elements. The earth puts together elements but the actual creation of the primary element, the chemical element, is done in the star, in, a, in the explosion of the star. And why, after an explosion, <coughs> the metals and all the elements, they come to us in groups, or even in a pure form. I have this uh, uh, little nugget, uh, which I bought in Australia, which was found on the ground. So gold was, uh, came like that from, from the earth. And, uh, and I don't know really, and nobody gave me a very clear answer. There, there are some uh, physical, chemical, physical uh, reasons, but uh, I know that uh, what happens uh, in the vacuum uh, is something quite uh, unusual. But is what is the inner nature of uh, the metal, what the metal does. So when we study chemistry, we uh, we study what happens uh, in between uh, uh, molecules or atoms, uh, but we don't think about all the others that are around. So I started thinking, yes, it would be nice to, to create some processes in vacuum. And uh, the, the first uh, vacuum chamber I did was very rudimental. It was built on a, a stock pot, an uh, industrial pot for cooking, and uh, with uh, <coughs> 
with a, a rotary uh, vacuum pump. I, I built myself this system, which is considered quite rudimental. I washed the whole environment uh, with algon, so I knew that uh, there was some gas inside, but at least I knew that it was that little bit was just argon. And uh, this is the first test I made, which was extremely encouraging for me. So they are just, they, it's not something woven, they are just threads of gold put together, uh, pressed in between two hot plates, uh, and heated up in, uh, in vacuum. Then I thought that this technique can allow me to, to make object with a very fine quality of details. So I wanted to make a bowl. And, uh, and uh, I made uh, a test, which was this. I, I actually used a wire that was too thin, and uh, the geometry of the wire, the, of how the wire was uh, put together, was not ideal. So this, uh, if you look at the bottom, you see that there is a crack. Uh, in, yes, basically, this is a very floppy uh, object, which is Nothing is on my desk, and it's a nice object, but cannot be handled. <coughs> so we haven't uh, removed uh, some things from this presentation, but um, okay. So I decided, uh, encouraged by the results, huh, I decided to make a, a more uh, professional um, vacuum chamber with a different type of, uh, of vacuum pumps, huh, so three steps three levels of vacuum pumps, like uh, <coughs> in, uh, in industry or in labo chemical laboratories done, to attain a higher degree of vacuum, what is technically called ultra-high vacuum. Um, I designed uh, um, a, a, a spherical chamber because actually the stock pot imploded. <laughs> <laughs> made a lot of noise, nothing <laughs> happened because there is no pressure, the pressure is outside, so it gets crushed like a can. And, uh, and this is the soldering together of the, of the vacuum chamber, that's the only thing that I had done outside from a specialized company, because I'm not good at soldering steel. And anyway, it has to be tested and uh, you need uh, some sophisticated equipment. And, and this is how it looks, the, the thing that I have uh, uh, in my studio, actually, it's, uh, next to my computer. Um, it looks more complicated uh, than, than what it is, because there are two small pumps. So this kind of equipment uh, is terribly expensive if you buy it new. Um, but uh, I actually found uh, uh, a lot of these parts, uh, the, the pumps and the, the tubes, the corrugated tubes, uh, on eBay. <laughs> uh, you just need to, to, to be ready to, to throw away a bit of money, just in case something faulty arrives. <clears throat> a lot of this uh, stuff was sold uh, as, a, as a batch uh, from a guy in the UK who was selling also sneakers and, uh, and, and t-shirts, uh, very old-fashioned. So I really hope it's not stolen. I think it was used for medical, uh, for medical use, so in medical industries things have to be changed uh, even if they, uh, if they work, because they, they, you can't afford them. So I built myself, uh, beside the um, the vacuum chamber, I built myself a loom to, to hold together and to stretch the wire. The loom is composed of a ring of metal holding lots of um, uh, pins. Yeah, okay, you can imagine how it finishes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is the actual bonding process. <coughs> <laughs> Believe me, there is nothing interesting to see, uh, but uh, somehow after all the work and uh, there is a lot of tension, so I, use, I spent uh, almost a day uh, into the night to reach the pressure and... Uh,
But anyway, this is what came out. Huh? It's a, a bowl made out of a crisscross of, uh, of wires. Huh? And, uh, yeah, this is the reflection of the bowl. And, uh, And uh, after that, I made also a brooch uh, with the same technique. And that's what <coughs> the latest uh, work I made. This it shows you the detail. You can see the things are held together, but they are not soldered. If I had to use solder, all the, those details, uh, they would uh, disappear. Thank you.